wonder if they recognize me too. I look down the aisle at that old altar, and I think about the times I've knelt and prayed. And I breathe a silent prayer of thanksgiving. God, I love the way makes me feel inside. That's what I miss the most. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The feeling in my soul, my heart overflows. That's what I miss the most. Johnson testifies just like he did back then and I feel the tears begin to fill my eyes and the preacher talks of Jesus about his grace and love and it stirs my heart and makes me realize this is what I need what I've been missing I've been caught up in this crazy daily grind how could I have ever been so foolish to ever leave this part of me behind that's what I miss the most Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the feeling in my soul, my heart overflows, that's what I miss the most, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, and how the most. And all the people said, Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Let's pray together and as we pray this morning, maybe there's something that's upon your heart that you want to share with the Lord. Maybe there's something in the Lord's heart that he wants to share with you. So let's bow our heads together and let us meet the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the quiet times together. We thank you, Lord, for the times of song. We thank you, Lord, for the times of prayer. And for the times of, of hearing your word as we worship. We thank you, Lord, that you call us softly and tenderly. And, Lord, that you 
you keep calling us and you keep speaking to us. And help us, Lord, to find those times to be quiet, to be still, and to listen to what you have to say. Thank you, Father, for opportunities that we have to be together to worship you uh, in spirit and in truth, to worship you, Father, in, in public. And Father, we are aware that there are many, many Christians this morning all around the world who are worshiping, worshiping you in private, in the darkest of places, because they're not allowed to be, to gather together publicly as we are. And we thank you, Father, for that privilege this morning in our country. We pray, Lord, that as we continue to worship this morning, that you would continue to speak to us. And, Father, that you would encourage us. And, Father, may we find hope today. And may we find help today as we've gathered together in your presence. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The story that I want to tell you this morning to begin with, I think could be filed under the category of, so you think you have problems. And the story is, is a true story. It's, it's a historical story. In fact, it, it really um, influenced the way that we even worship this morning. Uh, it's also a Halloween story to boot. Uh, because it took place on October the 13th, or excuse me, October the 31st, 1517, 498 years ago. There was a young Catholic priest and theologian by the name of Martin Luther. And on that date, he approached the castle church in Wittenberg, Wittenberg Germany. And he nailed upon that church door a paper containing 95 revolutionary opinions. Opinions that began the Protestant Reformation. And we refer to those 95 opinions as the 95 Thesis. And in them, Luther condemned the excesses and the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. He especially condemned the papal practice of the papal practice of, of asking uh, payment for people's sins to be forgiven they called them indul indulgences and so what you would do is if you had sinned uh, rather than repenting of your sin or doing something to counteract your sin you would simply pay the church and they would forgive you of the sin and that worked for people who were alive and it also worked for people who were dead. If they were in purgatory. Um, there, there was a popular phrase of the day that went like this. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Now as you might expect, Pope Leo X, who by the way was, was trying to raise money uh, to remodel the basilica and so he used this as a fundraiser so to speak and so you can imagine that he was not really very uh, happy about Luther's opinions in fact he called him a heretic uh, he had him excommunicated from the church and he also gave permission for anyone anywhere to kill him without any consequences at all. So, this morning, you think you have problems. Uh, the person that could probably ask that question this morning is the individual we're going to uh, focus on today. Um, the man is Joshua. And Joshua might say to us this morning, in his situation, he might say to us, so you think you have problems. And in order to really understand Joshua, we need to go all the way back uh, to the book of Numbers to really fully understand his situation. Because we're going to look at Joshua as he leads the people into the promised land. But before we can be there, we have to look at some of the background there. And you know the story. You know all that happened. Uh, 
back in Numbers, Joshua and Caleb had been minority voices when it came time to enter into the promised land. As the Israelites had left Egypt and they're making their, their way into the promised land and, and they get right up to the land and before they go in, Moses says, well, let's send out a, 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 a spying party. Uh, let's send some folks out so they can see what we have to look forward to and what we're going to find when we get into this land. And so they can send out 12 spies. And, and they go out and they spy the land for about 40 days and they come back and they return with a report. And they call the church, excuse me, they call the, they call the church together, they call the people together and they, and they present the report. And the report of the 12 is that the, the land is all that God said it was and more. And you know the funny thing about God, when God makes promises, he, he never, he never overextends a promise. Things are always better than what God says. And sure enough, the, the land of promise was, was filled with milk and honey. It was a land that was lush and fruitful. A land that was abundant in every aspect. And they brought this report back to the people. And then they said, oh, by the way, the land is filled with giants. And ten of the twelve gave a very discouraging report. And they said the cities of the enemy are immense. They said the armies of the enemy are too great. They said that we, in, in, in sight of the people that were there, we would be like grasshoppers, for they are like giants. And they said that there's no way, there's no way that the people of Israel would be strong enough to defeat the enemy. That's 10 of the 12. The other two, Joshua and Caleb, said that the folks that brought back the report, they were 100% they were factual in their report, but the report that they brought was a bunch of nonsense. Joshua and Caleb said that if they trusted the Lord, Joshua and Caleb said that if they would move forward, Joshua and Caleb said that if they would do as they were instructed by God, that they would be victorious. But guess whom the people listen to? They listen to the majority. Majority rules. And so as a result of their lack of faith, as a result of their lack of courage, the people of Israel were left to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until all of them died, except Joshua and Caleb. Because God would not have a people that refused to trust him to enter into the promised land. And that's an important lesson for us to learn today as well because we must have the courage to move forward. But what is it that holds us up? What is it that holds us back? What keeps us from moving forward, from actually doing all that we know that we should do? And this morning, we'll find in our study of Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, where we will find six obstacles, six obstacles that may keep us from moving forward, that may keep us from, from uh, obtaining all that God wants us to obtain. So I invite you to turn with me to Joshua chapter 1, and, and we're going to look in beginning in verse 1, we'll probably look all the way down to verse 9. Uh, we're not going to read it all at once, but I want you to find that passage, Joshua chapter 1. And we'll begin in verse 1, and we're going to look at six obstacles, six obstacles, obstacles that may keep us, if we're not careful, that may keep us from moving forward. The first obstacle that might keep us from moving forward is the days gone by, the past, the past can keep us from moving forward. Verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. And so right here, right at the very beginning of this account, 
Joshua is faced with, with the alarming reality that the leader for 40 years has died. And it's hard to, to live up to the past. It was now the time for, for Joshua to take the role of leadership. Moses, the Lord said, my servant has died. And so Joshua was called to take up the mantle. And it was, it was now his job to lead them forward. And that wasn't an easy task. It was nothing easy about it because Moses had certainly been larger than life. Moses had, had been a part of leading the people for 40 years. And 40 years before that, and 40 years before that, he was in, he was, he was in, in Egypt trying to lead the people. And now Joshua, it's his turn. And he's going to replace this experience inspired leader and how could he possibly fill those sandals if you will but even more than that would the people listen to him would they be able to forget the past and would they be actually able to move forward to where the Lord wanted to lead them and and, and what about our past what about your past and my past what should we do with it what should we do with all of those things that happened in the past? Let me suggest that, first of all, we should remember the past. Don't forget it. Don't toss it aside. There are lots of lessons to learn from the past. And so we need to remember the past. And secondly, we need to rejoice in the past. All of the accomplishments. We would not be here today were it not for our history. Would it, were it not for our past, and we need to rejoice in the past. But let me caution everyone and myself, particularly on this next one, we should not long for the past. Remember the good old days? The good old days? The good old days weren't all that good. I'm much more happy to be alive today than 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Instead of, 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 of longing for the past, we need to do the work of the present. Uh, instead of longing for the past, we need to move forward. For Joshua, Moses was dead. But God's purpose was very much alive. And God didn't want them just standing around thinking and, and dwelling and longing for the past. It, it wasn't a time for the people to be thinking, well, you know, there'll never be another man like Moses. It was time for them to keep building and to keep moving forward. And sometimes the past becomes an obstacle and it keeps us from moving forward. Secondly, the second obstacle that may keep us from moving forward is the dimensions. Um, it's, it's the big, large task. Look at verse 2. The Lord speaking to Joshua, he says, Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you in all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. And so here God gives to Joshua the same view as he gave to Moses. And he says, look as far as you can look. See as far as you can see in all of these directions beyond the Jordan, beyond the Lebanon. And God says, look at all that you can see and all of this, all of this is, is yours for the taking. What a scene. What a scene that must have been as, as, as Joshua looked all the way around. And was able to see as far as he could see. The Lord says, I have given all of this to you. It was huge. The dimensions were, 
were great. I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, uh, but they say, if you go to Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, and you get up on top of the mountain, they say that you can see seven states. There's that little plaque there, and it says, if you look over in this direction, you can see Alabama and Georgia, South Carolina and North Carolina and Kentucky and Virginia and Tennessee. You can see all of these states, and I don't, I don't think that's true, uh, but that's what they say. But it's, if you've been there, you see an, a, a, an amazing amount of land, uh, of area. And that's what Joshua saw. It was so big. It was so big. And the Lord says, this is all yours. Now sometimes, sometimes the task seems too big. Sometimes we see what God calls us to do and we say, man, that's, that's, too, that's too much. And, 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 and we don't know if Joshua hesitated at this point um, and, and where the Lord says, that, you know, don't worry, I'm going to be with you and I, I won't forsake you. But, but, but who could blame him? Who could blame him? Uh, it, it could have seemed like, like, like too much. Joshua said, this is too much. This is too much. And, and, and maybe he saw that. And you know, folks, sometimes God... God God has a lot for us to do. He does. And, and, and we think so, so small. And God thinks so vastly. The dimensions are great. And, and Joshua might thought, you know, I really, can't, I really can't do this. And maybe, Lord, give me something a little bit less to do. But then Joshua remembered what happened the last time the Lord told the people to go and do. And, and he remembered what happened 40 years earlier when the people hesitated. And he remembered how they grew fearful and how they saw the size of the enemy and how they panicked and how they had become a disaster. And, 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 and Joshua says, I know that this generation will be able to do this. It's vast. The dimensions are great. But this, this generation will be able to do this because we know that God is with us. And you see, knowing that God is with you helps cut those immense obstacles down to size. When God is with you, it's enough. The third obstacle that may keep us from moving forward is the deficiencies. Two words in verse 6. You see those first two words in verse 6. Be strong. The Lord says to Joshua, be strong. And, and I wonder why it is that the Lord tells us all the time, be strong. Look in scripture. All the time the Lord is saying, be strong, be strong, be strong. Why does the Lord tell us that over and over again? I think the answer is quite, quite simple. Uh, because we too easily lose our resolve in the face of the enemy. Uh, we too easily see the obstacles being too big. Uh, we give up. We throw in the towel too easily. We give in too easily. And the Lord keeps saying to us over and over again, Be strong. Be strong. The Lord had given the land to the people. He said, It's yours. But they had to possess it. And it was going to be difficult. And they were going to have to sacrifice. And they were going to have to persevere. And they were going to have to keep going. Becoming possessors of the promised land was going to take a long time. And if Joshua was going to be a successful leader, Joshua needed to possess an absolute resolve. And this wasn't going to happen overnight. And so God tells Joshua, be strong. And, and notice, notice where his strength was to come from. When God said be strong, he wasn't saying to Joshua, be strong in your own power. When the Lord tells us to be strong, he's not telling us to be strong in our own power. We become strong when we become dependent upon the Lord. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense to be strong by becoming dependent, but that's where our strength is comes from. And Joshua's success, like our success, comes because the Lord is with us. And he, Joshua, could be strong because the battle was the Lord's. 
Be strong and fear not the battle for the victory is always his. The fourth obstacle that may keep us from moving forward is the distresses in verse 6. Be strong and courageous. We talked about courage this morning. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. I wonder why the Lord tells us to be strong. I wonder why the Lord tells us to be courageous. And the reason why the Lord tells us to be courageous is because we get scared a lot. We get petrified. We get scared stiff. We fear the process. We fear the outcomes. We fear the consequences. We fear what if. What if. And as a result, fear can paralyze us. We become scared stiff. We become like petrified wood. Now maybe we won't label it fear. Maybe we'll call it something else. Maybe we'll say that we're kind of apprehensive or anxious. But in reality we're scared. We're petrified. And during those times when we're scared and we're petrified and we're anxious and we're apprehensive, the Lord says to us, be courageous be courageous and the Lord repeats this command over and over and over again because we are so easily frozen by fear the task that God has has given us can distress us because it seems so massive and there's this definite temptation that we have to simply run the other way to leave the situation and sometimes even the smallest of God's tasks can tempt us to decline. Someone asks us to do something that is, well, we're not comfortable with. Uh, they ask us to do something that, that we're afraid to do. Uh, something that is kind of out of our area of expertise. And our immediate response is no. We decline. Why? And we give all these reasons why. But the bottom line is that we're just scared. And whatever fills us with fear, whatever makes us afraid, we're to stop ourselves. We're to find courage and, and find resolve. Uh, and we need to say, we need to make this commitment that we will move forward no matter what distresses us. We will move forward because God has promised to be with us. The fifth obstacle that keeps us from moving forward sometimes is the distractions. Verse 7. Only be strong. There's that word again. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. Perhaps Joshua felt like he was the director of a cemetery. Uh, he had a lot of people under him. But nobody listens. And uh, sometimes we feel that way as well. And he wondered, would the people listen to him? Would they actually do what he, what, he, what he shared with them and told them to do? Or would they be distracted in the midst of the conflict? Distracted by so many things. It's easy to wander from the main thing. It's easy to wander from the main purpose. And so Joshua had to keep his focus and we need to remember to keep our focus if we're going to move forward as God calls us we need to be focused did the world offers plenty of distractions the world offers many distractions in terms of our possessions and our desires and and all the opportunities that, that face us and it's real easy to start on one thing and then be distracted 
but we nevertheless must understand that those things must take a lesser place if we're going to have true success. Our possessions and our desires need to take a lesser place if we're going to have true success. And then the sixth, uh, uh, sixth, sixth obstacle, delinquencies. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? What? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Another word for delinquent is negligent. The Lord saying to Joshua, don't be negligent. Don't be uh, delinquent. Uh, have you ever noticed how difficult it can be to ask for uh, directions? Be a hard thing. For men, it's especially difficult. It's especially hard to ask for directions. During a children's sermon one time, a child asked the pastor, who, by the way, was a woman. He asked the pastor, he said, he said, why did the Israelites wander around in the wilderness for 40 years? And before she could think of her biblical training, she simply brought it out because Moses wouldn't ask for directions. That's right. It's hard to ask for directions. It's hard to ask someone else. Joshua was not to be negligent. Uh, Joshua was not to be delinquent. He was to find direction, to search and seek for direction, and he was to find that by reading and studying and following the Word of God. And that's important for us as well. If we are to possess the courage to move forward, we can't rely on our own wisdom. We can't rely on our own strength. We can't rely on our own assets. Uh, let's not be negligent. Let's not be delinquent. Instead, we must study and we must follow the Word of God. And if we don't, look to God and look to God's Word as we move forward. Every challenge that comes our way will seem impossible. And so the Lord says to Joshua, and the people of Israel, be strong, be courageous, move forward. Don't let the past get in the way, but let it be a foundation for future growth in the kingdom of God. The Lord says to Joshua and the people, look ahead. Be strong and courageous and move forward. Don't let the size of the task get in the way. Instead, be excited. Be excited that God has so much for you to accomplish. Be enthusiastic. Be strong and be courageous and move forward. Don't be distracted. Keep your focus and realize that with God, there is no challenge that cannot be accepted. With God, there is no challenge that cannot be accomplished. He says, stay focused. What's holding you back? What is the obstacle that is keeping you from moving forward in your spiritual life? We've looked at six obstacles already. What is that obstacle that is keeping you down and keeping you from from moving in the way that God wants you to move. Why not this morning? Why not right now at this moment in time? Why not bring that obstacle forward? Bring that, come forward and bring that obstacle with you and, and lay it here at the front. And then go back having overcome the obstacle that is keeping you from moving forward in your spiritual life. Our hymn of invitation this morning is Great is Thy Faithfulness. And we've got plenty of room right here at the front.
We have room over there on the side. You can bring, no matter how big that obstacle is, you can bring it down and just lay it down here and pray and ask the Lord to remove that obstacle so that you can move, be courageous, be strong, and you can move forward in the way that the Lord is leading you. Would you stand as we sing this morning?